So remember last week when I asked if we could have some fun? Well, I got complained to because we didn't have any fun. <laughs> well, this is going to be fun for me. I don't know about you. We're going to find out. But it's going to be fun for me. So we're here in this newly renovated, newly carpeted, well-cleaned, crisp new sanctuary. So everybody stand up and find a new place to sit. I know, and I was happy. No, no, no. Across the aisle doesn't count. If you sit in the back, sit up front. If you sat up front, hey, your lucky day, sit in the back. But everybody get up and find a new place to sit. Find a new place to sit. Tim, sit. You guys are in a new spot. Just move to the other side. You moved forward. That was great. I was like, hey, yeah, sit down. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there you go. I want you to have a different perspective of the church and what it looks like from being in a different spot. Now, Bill, you didn't move. Carol and Jim, you didn't move. <laughs> you know, just because you've been here for a lot of years doesn't say, oh, well, I don't have to do that. I'm trying to get you to look at things differently, Mike. You didn't move. You never move when I say move, by the way. I just want you to know that. <laughs> now, look. I know that Jack's grandmother gave that pew to the church, which is why he always sits there, and even he moved. <laughs> See? See, it's time for you to get a different perspective, to get a, to, 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 for you to sit on the side that you can get the better view of me. And no, I don't mean behind me, because I know I look better back there. But, and no, you can't go sit out in the lounge area. I, I knew, I was waiting for you to just walk out there and do that. So, no, you can't sit out there. Now, isn't this fun? <laughs> yeah, I told you for me it is. Okay. Last week, we started going through some of the stories in Luke. And we found out that Luke didn't like rich people. Or at least that's what it looks like, is he doesn't like rich people. Well, today we're going to look at another story, and we're certain, we're certain people try to outsmart Jesus. And the gospel writers love these stories, stories where Jesus gets the better of those who seek to outsmart him. But a key to these stories is that Jesus always engages. I mean, he could have simply dismissed the questioners, the scoffers, and the sarcastic accusers, but he doesn't. He takes on all who come to him. And he hopes to pry open that their closed minds and to get them to look at something a little bit different, in a different way. He has high standards for the leaders of his people, and he shows his disappointment in how they're leading on more than one occasion. But he never gives up, and he never refuses to engage those who come to him. So let's see how he engages them in this story. I'm going to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 20, and let's look specifically at verses 27 to 38. It's on page 734 in the Pew Bible, if you reach behind you. There should be one there. No? What does Scripture say? Ask and you shall receive. 
So it's Luke chapter 20, verses 27 to 38. It's page 734 in the Pew Bible. We're going to read it responsively. <laughs> Did you ask for a Bible? Page 734, chapter 20, book of Luke, starting with verse 27. And it says, Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Read verse 28. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. I want you to read 30 and 31 and you'll see why. You don't think I was going to let you get away with just saying the second. No. Verse 32, finally the woman died too. I mean, can you blame her? Seven brothers. Oh my gosh, after marrying all seven brothers? Ugh. Anyway, read verse 33. And Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. Verse 35. And verse 36. And they can no longer die, for they are all like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. Verse 37. Verse 38, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. I want to say what a blessing it is to hear that in this church. Right? So, let's say a prayer. Thank you for being with us now, and thank you for letting us know there is a heaven, and making sure nothing stops us from having a relationship with you, even death. We look forward to living with you forever. This makes us feel incredibly happy and not sad. Father, we thank you for the cries of a newborn child, for that is the future of the church. So we thank you, Lord. Amen. In this story, Luke tells us that the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. But he doesn't tell us what the Sadducees were that they were the well-to-do folk in the community. And it makes sense if you think about it. I mean, when you have all that this world has to offer, why bother with something beyond it? Why would I worry about a resurrection if I have everything? If I hit that lottery Saturday night, why would I have to worry about a resurrection? Did anybody here hit that lottery? Okay. So I guess we'll continue to worry about the resurrection and keep moving on. You see, when you claim that being rich is a sign of God's favor and blessing on your life, then why not go all in on that? Oh, they had a sense of eternity, but their eternity, their eternity was in the legacy and in their children. Your name survives you. And that's what they were working for, is their name in the community. You see, it's not hard to find this sort of thinking around us today, right now. I mean, there are those who consider their wealth to be a sign of God's blessing and who live to ensure their legacy in this world. But perhaps what's most recognizable to us is the approach used to challenge different ways of thinking. You see, they don't show up to discuss Jesus' stance on the resurrection from the dead or what shape the kingdom of heaven will take in this world and the next. No, they come to make fun 
to ridicule or mock the very idea that anyone would hold an opposing view to theirs. And Jesus has just gone a round or two with the lawyers and the priests who wanted to talk to him about tax policy in the empire. And now he's faced with a contingent of Sadducees who just parked their fancy cars and strolled up in their tailored suits and proceeded to concoct a wild scenario designed to make belief in eternity look ridiculous. Now, they weren't looking for an answer. They were convinced there was no answer. Their only goal was to humiliate their opponent. So, Jesus, one bride, seven brothers, who owns her in eternity? Now, don't shoot the messenger. I'm not the one saying that women are to be owned. I, that's not me. It's not me. Well, see, then Jesus did that thing that he always seems to do in the gospel. He takes them seriously. No, really, he approaches the conversation as if it was a real question looking for a real answer, a solution to a complicated, if not impossible, problem. And he addressed them as if they were open to learning something and not just there to try to trick him. And the first thing he wants them to learn is that people aren't property in eternity. He'd like them to learn that people aren't property anywhere, but one step at a time. Well, wait, you're thinking, who said anything about property? Well, see, that's what's behind the question, property and legacy. Who gets to live on? Who has a name in this imaginary heaven is what they're wondering. But Jesus says, there is no giving away. There is no marriage because in heaven we are children of God, children of the resurrection, and therefore in heaven we don't exist to produce children. And something changes in the resurrection, says Jesus. Something you just barely understand. So having responded to their sarcasm, Jesus then does something else that he often does in these conversations. He answers the question that they should have asked. See, had they decided to enter this conversation by asking what basis was there for believing in the resurrection from the dead, it would have been a very different moment. Had they set aside their sarcasm and their dislike long enough to ask and to listen, we might have had a very different model for how differences of theology and theological opinion, how they could be handled. And what was the question Jesus wanted them to ask? What was the question? See, he wanted to meet them on their own ground and where they were. Now, the other thing about the Sadducees is that they saw only the books of Moses, the Torah, as Scripture. That's all they accepted as Scripture. Only Moses is authoritative for the, Sad for the Sadducees. So, Jesus turns to Moses, and the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed. So he kind of turns it right on them using their books. Uh-oh. I mean, now what? Where do they go from here? If my Torah is now saying that the dead are raised, what do I do? See, when he takes your hero and he shows him to be on the opposite side of the argument, it's hard to come up with a witty and a withering reply. And the Sadducees were like, we don't have a response at this point. If you read verse 39 and 40, you'll see what someone replied. Some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared ask him any more questions. That was their response. The scribes, the teachers of the law, who, were their f who wet their fingers and drew a line in the air, and they said, score one for Jesus the enemy of my enemy, you know, that kind of a thing. But the Sadducees, they don't respond. At least Luke doesn't give them space, space to respond. Now, there probably was a response. It was probably a loud and a negative response, but there probably was. 
And sure, they had read the verse before, but it doesn't mean what Jesus says it means. There's no way. It couldn't. Surely not. But what if? What if that is what it means? Jesus saw his mission as planting seeds. That's why he used those images so often to describe the kingdom. Now, a seed takes a while to grow. An idea takes a while to set up residence in the consciousness of a believer. Did he change their minds with that little altercation? It's hard to know for sure. But maybe a seed was planted. Maybe a mind was open to a new way of seeing the world and the creator of all that is. Or maybe it was a puzzles within a puzzle. The group came to Jesus with a riddle, a test to check his orthodoxy, as they defined it anyway. And Jesus riddled them right back. Now maybe there's a, a lesson there for us. Uh, maybe that lesson is that we should meet folks where they are and speak in their language and then let the Spirit work in them. Maybe we don't have to change them into what we want them to be, but we meet them where they are and let Jesus do the changing. I mean, after all, we've got an eternity to work with, and sometimes all we need to start is a new perspective a new way of looking at things, kind of like moving where you sit to get a different point of view. You see, if we weren't so quick to dig our heels in the sand and refuse to move, maybe we could take a moment to see it from the other side and then approach it with a little more understanding, a little compassion, a little, dare I say, Christian love. Jesus could have simply dismissed them with the wave of a hand, but he engaged them in a conversation. We too should engage people in conversation and not simply write them off or wave them away. After all, eternity is on the line. Isn't it worth it to at least give it a try? I'm glad someone thought I was worth the try. How about you? Let's pray. God of resurrection and new life, we give you praise for how you continue to abide with us and empower us to be more than we can imagine. Give us the courage to trust that you can and will use us to invite others into your kingdom. May we walk both with humility and boldness in your spirit this week. We pray this. Amen.